Okay, so I'm here again with Ernst Wilhelm, and uh, we're going to be talking today about a new work uh, that he's put out, the Nakshatra Sutras. Uh, this is a text that is a direct translation of some information that we have on the Nakshatras. And the goal, I think, based on reading the introduction to Ernst's work, is to give people an uncluttered translation, one that when they read it, there's not a whole lot of... Um, uh, input from the translator involved. So they're able to get sort of as direct as possible interpretation of nakshatras in English. Um, and so we're gonna talk about this today. And Ernst, uh, what inspired you to get involved in this? What inspired you to wanna to do this project? Okay, um, well, let's see. I, something I've, it's been on my mind to do for a long time, but I never took the time to actually get a copy of the Sanskrit book. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew there were some translations out there on it, but um, I didn't know how accurate they were or if they really got the gist of it. And my experience, most Sanskrit translations out there are very poor quality. Um, and one of the reasons they come out as poor quality is because the author wants them to read well. And when you start translating Sanskrit, literally, it's not going to read well to an English speaking person, just, just because of sentence structure and just because of the dy dynamics of the language, it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. So um, it's something I've been wanting to do for a long time, but you know, we've been, me and my wife have been working on some more nakshatra related stuff with medical astrology. And so she was like urging me, she said, oh, get that book, just do it, go find it. And so she like just said, go to the computer and get it. So I went there found it, and then we sat down and started working on it. So she was kind of the final kick in the butt to do this thing I've been wanting to do for probably 15 years, you know? Okay, okay. Yeah. And so this, uh, the work that you're talking about, this is, uh, pardon the mispronunciation if I am pronouncing it incorrectly, but it's Titeria Brahmana, correct? Yeah. Okay, and what I wanna do, I know we're gonna get into some more specifics about how you're using these nakshatras, but to sort of set the stage, um, what is the context of this particular text? Like, and the reason I ask this is because when a lot of people start getting into nakshatras, they tend to um, say, we use it for this, we use it for that, but with this particular description in this book, okay. what is the context of it? Okay, so this, this Taitreya Brahmana text is an extension of the the black Yajurveda, or what they call it Krishna Yajurveda. And the Yajurveda is kind of like a handbook for the priest. So it's in the Yajurveda that you get all the things that the priests are supposed to do. Um, mantras are supposed to do, sacrifices are supposed to do, but not all of it's actually in the Krishna Yajurveda. So they have all these sort of extensions. And this Taittiriya Brahmana is one of those extensions. So you can kind of say this book was originally written for the priest class, for you know, doing their ceremonies, practicing their practices and stuff. So sort of, an, that makes it a bit of an exclusive text. And when you find the Vedas, like you can find a copy of the Rig Veda pretty easily, which has to do with just the basics of Hindu philosophy. Then you can get the um, Arthur Veda, which has all these basically spells and mantras that anyone can do. You want to spell for love, open up the Arthur Veda. You want to destroy your enemy, open up the Arthur Veda and chant that line, you know? That's so like the oldest magic book on earth. And then you can find the Sama Veda, which is, has a lot of hymns that people would do, particularly priests. But the Yajur Veda is the one that's most directed towards like the priest caste. Okay. And so um, we kind of almost can look at those nakshatras in that context. Like there's other parts on nakshatras in this book. This is just the most important part. Um, there's some other parts too, and what some of the parts talk about the nakshatras to do certain yajnas on, you know, which because the priests want to make sure they do the right, you know, have a right nakshatra. So there's some of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it's just full of, um, you know, hymns and chants that priests would be doing and directions for priests, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the first book, there's in the fifth chapter of the first book, we have this section on nakshatras. There's um, not all of it, just one, there's a couple parts of nakshatras in that part, two parts basically, and the rest just goes on to other stuff. So the, this one part that deals with all 27 nakshatras, um, you know, covers that. There's other parts in the book that have nakshatra stuff, but never does it like say every nakshatra. It'll say this nakshatra, you know, 
it'll have like a chant to a nakshatra, but it doesn't have a chant to all 27 nakshatras. It just has a chant to some nakshatras. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple other interesting bits and pieces, but by far the most, you know, really the chapter that seems the most designed for, you know, really understanding the nakshatra is this chapter. And it goes okay. through them all, all 27 ruthlessly. Whereas the other one jumps around, talks about this nakshatra and this nakshatra and doesn't even cover them all. Right, right. So, you know, when we were um, hanging out at the Sedota conference, there was definitely some nakshatra fever going on. Um, yeah, it seems like that's the rage these days, yeah. Yeah, and so my question is, with this book, with this work, um, I know that you discussed in the beginning that this is a great source of contemplation to give people deeper insights into the nakshatras. But my question is, how, um, after we read these things, after we contemplate these things, is there any particular way indicated about how to apply these to a chart or to apply them in regards to a planet being in a nakshatra? Or... Yeah. See, with these sutras, they really, what they're doing is they're helping you understand the energy of the nakshatra. You know, the energy is this, the nakshatra is a conscious force and a force is energy, right? Mm -hmm. So it's this energy that has a, a, an intelligence to it, a consciousness to it. And it's this intelligent energy, of course, that creates life, right? And the nakshatras are basically just a breakdown of that intelligent energy. You know, that intelligent energy is all encompassing. It's everywhere. It surrounds us, right? Mm -hmm. It all manifests out of the galactic center in our galaxy. But our galaxy has manifested out of the, some universal center that we're not even sure where it is. Mm -hmm. But there's this, this, you know, intelligent energy which creates life and, and, um, and everything is all around us. And so these nakshatras, of course, are all around us, right? They're, they're the circle of space around us. And so it's just a breakdown of that conscious, intelligent energy that is granting life. Okay. And, and, they, okay. and this, they just tell you, how, they just try and want you to get to the understanding of that energy, of that life creating energy. But they don't tell you, okay, now go do this in your horoscope. Right. Well, so... You know, I, I don't necessarily have nakshatra fever. And when I use nakshatras, I, I pretty much apply them simply to things like muhurta. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, interpreting the Vimshatari dasha system. Um, so I'm curious, when we think about these nakshatras related to chart analysis, um, how, how can we do that in a way that's not just... Uh, in, in a sense, like reading tea leaves, because, you know, when I see people working with nakshatras, oftentimes it seems like they'll have a, a list of properties of the nakshatras. And like when you meet the kind of psychic, they start just sort of spitting things out. And when they notice a hit, then they sort of rely upon that. So how can we use this in a some kind of scientific way, astrologically, um, yeah. the nakshatras? I've certainly noticed that most of the people who are having nakshatra fever, as we're deciding to call it this day, <laughs> That um, and that's not in a derogatory way at all. It's, it's no, more no, no. Excitement. Right. These people that are excited about nakshatras, I find they're the intuitive-centered astrologers. Mm -hmm. And and I, and again, I just say that because just from reading body parts, I can look at their hands. I go, oh, I know that's an intuitive person, you know. Yeah. And um, so they tend to be the more intuitively centered astrologers, which makes sense because the nakshatras have to do with the realm of the moon. The moon is not intelligent. He's all knowing. He's perceptive. Mm -hmm. He's receptive to what is. It's the sun that's intelligent. And of course, the sun creates the Rashis and it's a sun that's structured and dependable and reliable. So right. I think that definitely with the nakshatras, most of it is an ability to sort of tune into their energies, get a feel for their energy, and then start being receptive and perceiving that feel as one encounters it. And I think that's why this text, it really is talking about trying, you know, really these sutras were for us to get a feel for this, this, this energy, you know, um, and, the, and, this, and everyone as they get a feel for an energy will create a different story about that nakshatra. Because again, these nakshatras are the conscious force underneath everything happening in the world. Right. You know, so we can't say there's only 27 things happening in the world. So every nakshatra can give birth to countless actual concrete things but it all comes out of that there's a certain energy behind a certain thing that the nakshatra gives so people who are intuitive who can tune into that energy can make that next connection to the concrete thing that that energy is creating in another person okay you know 
And I think that's why we don't have as much stuff on the kshatras as we do on planets and signs and all that stuff and houses on these very more concrete things um, because they're not as, I don't think we could label nakshatras in the same way. It's more what's, there's an energy that's going to burst something out of a person's consciousness, but that energy can burst so many things. For instance, there could be an energy of needing to go fast, right? Mm -hmm. So now I've got lots of options. I could become a downhill skier. I can get be a jet pilot. I can be a race car driver. I can be a downhill mountain biker. I can be a track sprinter. You know, they're all this, it's the energy behind it is this need for speed, right? Mm -hmm. but I can fulfill that need to speed in so many ways. With the nakshatra, we might be able to say, okay, this nakshatra has this energy, but it can manifest in many, many ways. An intuitive person will latch on to that way. Once they latch into the energy, the next picture that comes into their mind is the concrete thing that that person will latch on to them. And mm -hmm. based on that, people have tried to create like concrete rules that this nakshatra is this concrete thing and this nakshatra is this concrete thing and sometimes it is but statistically if we test that on lots of charts i haven't found them those concrete things to work out like really reliably because lots of times that same energy is going to be found manifest in a different concrete thing so i right. like when it comes to concrete things i want to i'll be staying with the signs and the planets and the houses which are the concrete realities. But it's important to understand, I think, that those concrete realities are manifesting out of this circle of consciousness, which is the nakshatras. Okay, that makes sense. And um, I think you helped to describe it, that there could be a difference between sort of the concrete aspect and then, of course, the intuitive aspect. Mm -hmm. And the thing, as I, was, as I was reading through this work, I kept kind of I kept thinking to myself, you know, how can we actually test these things? Because, for example, a lot of the descriptions of, of the nakshatras, I mean, that can easily show up just simply in particular planetary combinations. So my, my issue with it was a little bit, how, mm -hmm. are we, how are we going to determine, is it the nakshatra giving it this kind of energy, or is it simply the Venus-Moon conjunction, or is it the Mars-Saturn conjunction, or is this not something that we should really be considering in that regard? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it needs to be used in its appropriate place. And the appropriate place in the nakshatras is the underlying consciousness. So okay. the ocean of consciousness that's going to grow out of. And but what's going to grow is going to be, you know, indicated in the chart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the person's relationship to things are very much going to be indicated by the planets and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. For instance, one of the little debates, not a little you know, discussion some people have it on my astrology group was about the cruel and, you know, right. you know, cruel, some nakshatras are cruel and right. some nakshatras are harsh and so on. And they're like, but I'm not cruel. It's like, no, we're not, that doesn't mean a person, if a person has their moon in a cruel nakshatra, let's say, it doesn't mean they're going to be cruel people. Be, what, a cruel person is someone who's going to have certain planetary afflictions, you know, like a person has Saturn, Rahu, Moon, Mars together, something or, you know, Moon, Mars, um, Rahu together, K2. They, they all have a part of them that is struggling with actual cruel actions, you know, right. or holding it back or suppressing their cruel side, perhaps. But when we have like the Moon in the Nakshatra, it just shows the consciousness operates under a cruel banner. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means a person will be hard on themselves, they'll be cruel to themselves, you know. They'll be harsh on themselves. They'll be expecting things of themselves. They'll push themselves. They'll feel comfortable in more stressful situations, you know, in cruel situations. So, but it doesn't mean they're out there causing cruel deeds. Right. You know? Well, yeah. So with that, with that idea, um, that the moon makes sense because that's a very personal planet. It's our emotional nature. So if we took that to uh, uh, another planet, like say Mercury, um, how might we interpret some of those things in that regard? Like, does it mean you're cruel to your friends? You know, you do cruel things with your friends or? Yeah. It, again, I think so much of what's happening with nakshatras is really what's happening on the interior of the person and their consciousness. Okay? okay. So a person who's got mercury in a cruel nakshatra, if mercury is well disposed, which means that they have the capacity for friendship. So mercury is in good condition. Um, it has some aspects of friends you know, isn't debilitated, has big bala, things like that. If it has some good qualities to it, that person, of course, is going to be good with their friends. Right. Okay. Okay. But one of the reasons they'll be good with their friends because they'll be 
again, they'll be, they might be hard on themselves. Like sometimes imagine you could be, ah. sometimes you have to be hard on yourself to be good to your friends. Right. Like today I could be sunbathing. I'm being really hard on myself hanging out with you today. <laughs> just joking. But you know, so sometimes you got to be a little cruel, you know, it's just like, there's a hardship to it. So right. one of the things you can look at with that is that a person with mercury in good shape will make hard sacrifices maybe for their friends. Whereas okay. a person who's got an afflicted mercury with, you know, an afflicted mercury, you know, again, it's not, it's afflicted because it's starved, things like that. Um, and then it's in, I say, cruel Nick Chakra. Well, then they're going to feel like their friends are being cruel to them, but they themselves will be cruel to their, to their friends. They'll have a cruel right. streak. They might have it suppressed, but it's there. Um, but they'll very much perceive their friends as being cruel. But see, we only can perceive in others what we are ourselves. Otherwise, we don't notice it. So, right. um, so you know, that's the level the cruelty is working on. So, yeah, you can have that element in friendship, but that doesn't mean you're a mean person to your friends. Mm -hmm. It just means there's a... And then also, you might be there for your friends more when they're having hard times. Mm -hmm. So instead of just having fun with friends and being friendly and having things light and easy, like a Shipra light Nikshatra might do, is when your friends are in trouble that you're there for them. So you're, when you're dealing with your friends, you're dealing with more of the cruel realities of life, the harsh realities of life. So that's when the consciousness gets going. It's the consciousness going to be working in that realm. But no, it doesn't mean a person's going to be cruel at all to their friends. Okay. Okay. So going along with the idea of nakshatras, uh, I know we've talked about this before. I mean, oftentimes people will say things like, well, I know I am this particular, nak my moon's in this particular nakshatra because, um, you know, I, I have these personality traits or whatever it might be. And, you know, I've gone through and I've looked at all my plants and all the nakshatras and I've also read your works and studied nakshatras elsewhere and saw that, you know, sometimes I relate to nakshatras that, I've, that I don't even have a planet in, okay? Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at the nakshatras in this regard, you know, what do you recommend people to do so that they sort of avoid falling in that trap of sort of blaming a nakshatra for something that might not necessarily be nakshatra related? <laughs> yeah, and see, that's a prevalent problem we have in astrology. We don't just have that problem with nakshatras. We have it, I have to be this ascendant because I'm like this. Right. Well, the ascendant doesn't make you like this very much. A planetary conjunction does it way more, you know? Right. So, you know, and so this is just the problem people have. They focus on one thing and they blame some part of themselves on something that they're convinced has to be it. When they don't realize those qualities are actually coming from something else. And okay. meaning that if they found a, 10 people who had that same thing that they're blaming that quality on, mm -hmm maybe two of them, three of them would have that quality mm -hmm. because it's not based on that. It's based on something they don't know about. Right. The only solution to that is for people to not get stuck on something and to continue their studying and learning until they can approach the chart holistically right. and understand really where is this really coming from? Because mm -hmm. this is just a prevalent problem in astrology where people, you know, people come up and, and come, you know, come up with these, theories you know that they consider to be gospel truth based on just examining one little aspect of the horoscope mm -hmm. um so really the key is to learn to examine a horoscope holistically and understand where things fit into with each other right okay yeah. and as i was going through and um you know reading this text you, you you spend obviously a lot of time because it's in the text on the idea of the powers of the planet, you know, from above and from below. And, okay. you know, I discussed briefly with you a theory I had on that, but from your perspective, um, how, what is that about exactly? And how do we determine if we're going to get the from above or from below, or is that even really the relevant way to look at it? Yeah. You know, honestly, I don't know. I don't have a really a, a perfect answer to that. Um, I think that's something we need to spend a lot more time contemplating and seeing how those manifest. Mm -hmm. um, my present view, which I'm sure will change as I play with them more, is that um, you know above and below are sort of mirror images of each other. Uh -huh. So there's something happening in the you know above in the heavens, and it's going to be reflected in what's happening on Earth. Okay. And but I don't, I'm not going to say it happens in heaven first, then it happens on earth. It, and I'm not going to say it happens on earth first, and it happens on, in heaven second. I think it's a, simultane, a simultaneous occurrence. 
And, okay. and you know, humans, we love this idea that what came first? It's like the chicken and the egg. You know? Right. What came <laughs> well, oh, my answer is there. One day there was an egg and a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so we love to have this idea: what came first? What came first? What came first? Right. But it doesn't work that way, um, you know, with the nakshatras, with this above and below, I don't think. I think it just, it's a mirror image reflection of that there's an occurrence, and this occurrence has a slightly different, you know, looks a little differently on earth as in heaven, okay? But it's the same occurrence. So we can't really separate them, I don't think, right. um, you know? But yeah, there may be a way where a person gets more involved with one another, like a shwini, has the community from above and the army from below. Mm -hmm. So is the person, you know, living in, is the person making the community happen or are they serving in the army? Right. You know, so was there one, is there a way to find out if one's being done more than the other? Um, I haven't tried to figure out which that, what it is, but I don't think it would be that difficult to have a research, you know? Right. Um, you know, so we, I'm sure there's ways that we can discover which a person's manifesting more. But then again, when you think about it, if someone's, you know, seriously invested in the army, they're doing it as a patriot for their community. So you really can't separate the two. I think ultimately what will determine the difference is if a person has, you know, Mars as a career planet and Mars is related to the sixth house or the 10th house, he'll be a leader in the army. Whereas if, you know, the sun or Venus is a career planet, he'll be involved in more government affairs. Right, right. You know, and so I think that it'll be more those things that, you know, those are the concrete realities, right? Right. Um, those will be indicated more by the Rashi techniques of Jaimini Sutras. So you're, you're looking at it more as though these are powers that are existing simultaneously versus when I read through it, the idea that came to my mind was that um, um, when it's in a, when maybe the moon or a planet mm -hmm. is in a particular state or situation that um, the above energy would be more prevalent or yeah. the below energy would be more prevalent. You're seeing it as it's, they're both happening, not one that, or the other. That's why I'm seeing it. But again, I haven't researched enough to know. Um, you know, I just translated these, you know, you got them a day after I did. Right. So, <laughs> and the old sutras we had on these were really a mess that what we've been trying to work with. Uh -huh. And I always found the way the, the sutras were translated with some extra stuff in there that was not really appropriately placed. And so my brain would be struggling over it going, okay, how do I conceptually this work? How do I get the feel for this? And I would feel stuck all the time, you know? Right. And I, I didn't feel like it was working. My brain couldn't work with it. I, and it, I couldn't integrate the words in those sentences that people had written. And um, so I just said, it just didn't feel right. I couldn't make progress with it. And right. so... I wanted, that's why I wanted to translate these sutras so I can have something that I could sink my teeth into more and make progress. And, you know, more as we were translating these, my wife and I, we were getting more insights about these sutras than I ever did from the old translations. So I have a tremendous amount of contemplating and learning to do about these sutras myself now that I actually have them in front of me, you know. Right. And each of these sutras deserves hundreds of hours of contemplation. But... There may, there may be several ways that determine above and below. It could simply be, is it north or south? Is the planet traveling north or south of the ecliptic, right? Right, exactly, yeah. It could be, is the moon waxing or waning, which you were maybe thinking. Right. Um, it could simply be, is the planet closer to K2 or closer to Rahu, which is another thing. Because, of course, K2 is, you know, the moon's path below the horizon, where it gets below the ecliptic. Mm -hmm. And Rahu, where Rahu is, all the way to K2 is the path where, the moon is above the ecliptic. So right. we have an above and below simply based on where the moon is traveling or so where, where, where the planet is. Following that, you know, two questions. Number one, um, you, know, you mentioned the idea that, that came to mind when I, I sent that to you, which is, you know, the moon as it waxes and it wanes, and I'm not sure if this is applicable below the equator um, because I've never lived below the equator, but at some point in time, it seems like the moon is actually above the sun as it's moving away from the sun. And then it looks mm -hmm. like it's under the sun, which in my mind thought, well, if, um, if we have the sun in that state, then maybe we pay attention to uh, the below for um, plants yes. and chakras or above. But my mm -hmm. question is this beyond that, how, 
would you, how, you told me to test it. And I thought that's a great idea. But then I started thinking more about it and I started seeing, yes, but there's all these other things in the chart like we discussed that could contribute to some of these experiences. Yeah. How would you test it? Or how would you recommend other people think about this so that they could look at it in their own chart? In that yeah, regard? it's just the way you have to test it. That's why I always got testing in enough charts. Okay. To get to sort of, you know, get enough. And that's why you'll never get any test will test out 100% when you test one thing because there's always other things giving the same thing, right? Right. So, um, so really it's just, it's just about doing numbers of charts. Like Carmina is really a great researcher. I am just really impressed by her research ability. She, she's like working on a book now with musicians and careers and she's got like hundreds, you know, most people when they write a book like that, they'll get like 10 people, you know, Oh, I did this big research. This is what makes me. <laughs> think. She's like, I don't like a couple hundred, like over 200 and some, she's just a, you know, that's a researcher. Most astrologers don't have that in them. Most astrologers are too new agey, you know, right. too intuitive, right? To bolt down there and do that kind of research. But really, we need scientists like Carmina to, to churn out these researches. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, that's a serious amount. Of, that's a lot of data crunching, you know? And she did it all without asking me to program something special to make it easier for her, which everyone who wants to try more than 10 things always asks me. So right. you know, I'm really impressed with her, her with her you know, integrity of research. But so we need to, we just need to try it on lots of charts. Now I think we should, if we want to try to figure out if there's something that's an above and below, the approach I would do is say, okay, astronomically, what are some above and below things? Mm -hmm. And there's basically two things. First of all, the moon, when the, like you're sort of mentioning the moon, when it's North or South of the sun, well, when the moon's going from Rahu to K2, at that point, it's north of the sun. It's north okay. of the ecliptic. Got it? Yes. When it's from K2 to Rahu, it's south of the ecliptic. Okay. So that could be the above and below. Right. But I don't think that's going to be the above and below for all nakshatras. Mm-hmm. What I would do is I would say, oh, this planet is in this nakshatra. This was the first thing I would test, okay? okay. If I was going to try to figure out what would cause above and below. So maybe someone will jump on this before I get to it. But the first thing I would test to try to predict if the above or below manifest more. I'll probably do it later today, so it sounds exciting, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully someone else will do it. Carmine, are you watching? Okay. Is I would um, look at where that planet is. If it's from Rahu to K2, I know it's, ab- it's, north, of, it's, a, it's north of the ecliptic mm-hmm. of the sun. But see, with the planet, it can be a little different because planets also have their latitude and longitude. Mm-hmm. But I probably wouldn't worry about that at first. I would just see if it's between Rahu, if it's Rahu to K2, I would consider it above. And from K2 to Rahu, I would consider it below. Mm-hmm. And then if that didn't work, I would actually look at the planet's latitude if it's north or south of the ecliptic. Because um, the planet can be, you know, in the north side of the ecliptic, you know, or, you know, of that, but it could possibly you know, in the zodiac, it still could be there, but it could still be below the e- ecliptic at certain times due to the planet's latitude. Mm-hmm. Rahu and Ketu are based on the moon's latitude, but another planet could be at a different latitude. You understand? Yeah. So that can throw some errors into it. So those are the things I would try. I would start there, I think. Okay. Okay. Well, that sounds good. And hopefully we'll send this video to Carmina and she can get on it as well. <laughs> yeah. She can skip Christmas and get this done for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you recommend um you know when i started reading this this work one of the things i, I really loved about it was um it does give you a lot of things to contemplate mm-hmm. and it does give you sort of a deeper sense of what might the sages or rishis or whatever it might be be trying to share with this idea of the nakshatras so how do you recommend a person contemplate these things just in meditation themselves or by going through the text and seeing, well, my planet is in this nakshatra. How does that relate? What is your take on that? See, my impression about these sutras is that they're not exactly designed for astrologers. Okay. You know, this is not from an astrology book. This is from an appendage of the priest's handbook, right? Right, right. So this is for Brahmins. This is for people who want to understand the motions and life of the entire universe and find their place in it. And I think that the best way to use these sutras is to use them to understand the whole process of life and living and, and, and spirituality, you know, what's the process of what's happening to us spiritually, the process of what's happening to us emotionally, the process of 
what's happening physically on earth. And to see this as a way, as basically a story of how life is manifesting and to get more tuned into how life is manifesting. And just, I think it's, uh, I think these sutras are about a person just saying, okay, I'm going to tell you how it is based on the kshatra. So okay. you know how we have the mamamsa, you know, sutras and the, the Shankya Yoga sutras. So we have these different ways that creation is explained, right? Right. And this is just, the explanation of creation via the nakshatras. In fact, I think I'm going to rename my book, okay? To that. Okay. Well, I, I, li- I like that personally uh, more so because the way they're written, they are going to access aspects of your consciousness, which in the, at the end of it all, are you really going to need astrology? Exactly. If you <laughs> understand these sutras, you're, you don't need astrology. <laughs> right. Well, you know, there's also the thing, you know, I like Ramana Maharshi when uh, pe- someone asked him about the, um, the, the categories of cosmic manifestation, you know, what I'm talking about the Sankhya mm-hmm. philosophy. Um, he, he, they said, are, are, should we study these things? And he said, well, do you uh, examine your trash before you throw it out? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> but anyway, so what you're saying is with this work, um, this could be uh, more spiritually uh, pleasing to the individual, maybe more so than astrologically? Well, I think the place to start with it is from the point of view of understanding. Okay. I mean, you know, I think the astrologer who understands life better mm-hmm. is going to be a better, under, a better astrologer. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think one of the big liabilities astrologers have as astrologers is a lot of them don't understand life all that well. Meaning okay. that when it comes down to it, a lot of these astrologers, even though they might really be good at predictions are not necessarily understanding how life is not very mature in the context of life. You know, I regularly meet astrologers that I don't feel are as mature as my 16 year old daughters. Okay. Actually they're 15. Like when I, some of the things I hear my daughter say, I'm like, wow, (laughs) you know, sometimes, you know, and, I, I actually feel like a lot of you know a lot of these um, a lot of astrologers are not really as mature as they should be to be in a counseling centered role. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Of course, making predictions isn't counseling; it's just snapping out a prediction, right? right. But you know, it, so it depends where a person's working from. A person can have be very skilled in making predictions, have fun in games. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it's like doing parlor tricks, like being a magician, you know, and pulling rabbits out of hats. But that doesn't make a person mature. That doesn't make a person capable of giving any guidance whatsoever. That doesn't mean a person understands life at all. Mm-hmm. And a priest's job is to understand life, right? Right. And so, again, this is written for the priest. Do you want to be, you know, a ro- a, do you want to play the role of someone who understands life? Then, yes, learn these sutras, and that's what the most valuable gift. And, yes, you can use these, learn these sutras, and, and get into the energy of them and understand the nakshatra better and therefore do the nakshatras better for predictions too. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't think I, that's the easiest way to make good predictions. I would just learn Varshafala or Jaimini, <laughs> you know, and make some amazing predictions, you know, or just learn good old Brihat Parashara astrology and do amazing predictions and you don't have to spend all that time contemplating. Mm-hmm. But I think astrologers where really they need a lot more help it's just in their context of understanding life, understanding humans, understanding the thing that's in front of them. Mm-hmm. There's a real lack of that knowledge in the majority of, of astrologers. And I, I find in the Western astrology world, there's so many people into it. And if I had to say there's one defining quality that Western astrologers have is they're very highly sexed beings. Okay. So, a lot of their ideologies about humans comes from a sexual point of view. I'm not saying that's the only one, but if I, if I, if I just had to pick the dominant theme amongst Western astrologers is that there's a a lot of sexuality involved in their mode of thinking and their understanding of life. Okay. Which is why they think the eighth house is in a a spiritual astrological house. (laughs) (laughs) So good joke. Actually, they probably think about the seventh house too. Anyway, (laughs) And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Sexuality is a huge part of life. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's not the root of everything. Right. And yes, we can talk about everything in the context of sex and explain it away. You can actually, 
because sex is such a big part of life. Life happens out of sex, right? But there's a there's a something deeper there. And again, some Western astrologers, a lot of them aren't that. Just, if I had to think, find the single most common denominator, and I've had I've met Western astrologers that say the only thing I'm interested in talking about is sex and astrology. <laughs> and one of my close astrology friends, who was a very good friend with when I met her when we were Western astrology, it's all she ever wanted to talk about: sex and astrology, sex and astrology, sex and astrology. She's a very successful Western astrologer too. And most of her clients come to talk about sex and astrology. <laughs> right. and, um, and I've seen a lot of that. Not say everyone. I'm not trying to make a stereotypical. I'm just saying right. if I, maybe it's only 10%, but then there's nothing that's 11%. You know, there's nothing right. else 10%. So, um, so the understanding in Western astrology is, is limited to some degree. And in Vedic astrology, I think also there's a, the understanding of life is very limited by I would say two different concepts. One concept is this idea of giving away the power and spirituality, mm. okay? And not realizing that being a spiritual being means first and foremost being a powerful being, okay? A, being a person who could stand on his two feet. Because mm. you have to stand on your own two feet. Okay, the guru is gonna do 75%, right? But the 25% you're going to do is, is you have to give 100% of that, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this stuff, in you, which means you can't give any of that power away. You have, to, you have to own up to all that 25%. So one thing I see in some Vedic astrologers is this, again, it's just that Hindu word, is too much world of too much giving away of one's power. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have to give away all the ego power, but hold on to all your own power and do your 25%, 100%, you know? And no, no one's going to make up for your mistakes, you know, when it comes down to it, you know? Right. You know, you, when you hear stories about people who failed in something, their guru saved them, trust me, that person gave their 100% mm -hmm. and they failed. And then their guru saved them. They didn't get 90% fail and get saved by their guru, okay? Right. So I think that people need to understand that life doesn't quite work that way. It's a real delicate thing, this spiritual path. And the other thing, I think, you know, there's this understanding of life that a lot of Vedic astrologers like to portray that um, once we know our future, we can, um, we can improve our lives. So they actually think that predicting events is an important thing to do. They actually feel like they're serving humanity by predicting an event and that the person knowing that event can change their life. No, because... If you if you know an event is happening, there's nothing you can do to change it if, if, there's, if it's predicted right. You're not going to change it. It's going to happen. And the only thing that could possibly change it is a miracle, a magnetic miracle of your energy shifting to where it can change. Mm -hmm. And knowing an event's going to happen and trying to plan around it just doesn't do that. So this idea that we can plan around our bad events because we know them, that we can avoid them, astrology is not that kind of map. It's not a map that says, okay, there's three roads. The road you're taking will land you in a pit, so take this other road. No. Astrology <laughs> is like, there's one road. There's a pit in it. You're going to fall in that pit. Would you like to understand the purpose of that pit in your life? Or do you just want to fall in the pit and cry and scream? Mm -hmm. That's the two options in astrology. Okay? And that requires a lot of understanding of life to talk to a person on that level. And so I think most astrologers, whether Western or Vedic astrologers, the large portion of them need a broader understanding of life so they can help their clients heal and make progress in life rather than just talk about sex or make predictions, you know, or well, just tell them to surrender, just surrender, just surrender to the God and guru. No, we need more than that. Right. So with this idea, you know, one of the difficulties I've, I've had with astrology is it's distracting power where a lot of people may be going through a difficult situation and by having the astrologer say, oh, well, it's just because of this Saturn or this Mars or this Rahu, then they sort of disengage themselves from actually going through that experience and feeling the grief or moving through whatever it might be. Um, when you think about astrology in that way, I mean, is there any... Is this kind of what you're getting at, kind of getting people more into their life so that they are present for the good stuff and present for the bad stuff and they are fully alive in that sense? Or Yeah, it, that can happen both ways. When somebody starts getting into studying astrology, there is a serious danger or possibility of them getting 
so intellectually involved mm -hmm. that the emotional parts of themselves get ignored, mm. you know, and oftentimes the way reason people get into astrology because it's because they've been hurt emotionally and getting intellectually involved. If they have an intellectual fire mm -hmm. by getting intellectually involved, they don't experience that pain. So astrology right. is a, one of the great intellectual escapes for sure. Mm -hmm. Eventually a person has to catch up to that pain. So I think astrologers, anyone who does astrology is an intellectually centered person to some degree, some more than others, you know, but, and I think those people need to remind themselves that, okay, I can intellectualize about this and try to understand this, but I can't get lost in that. I need to work out the emotional I have to pay attention to what's happening to the other half of me. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what will happen in astrology can intellectualize for years and years and years and years and then crash and burn because mm -hmm. those uh, those that intellectualizing can help the beginning of processing emotions, but it won't process the emotions. At some point, the person has to go there and work out the emotional stuff, grieve and cry and do what they have to. They have to work through that pain on an emotional level. And intellectual people have such a high capacity for working through pain on an intellectual level that they can feel like it's worked out on an emotional level, but it's not. And if they'll know it's not because they'll be moody, they'll get sick for no apparent reason. They'll be living healthy and be sick. They're not living on Oreos and you know, they're still sick. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then those are two indications of, gosh, my intellect is not getting the job done here and signals that the astrologer needs to tap into the other parts. Now, most people who come to astrologers are not as intellectually centered. They're in much less danger of being lost in the intellectual woods. Okay. Some of them are, but a lot of them aren't. A lot of them just have this belief that astrology can hurt them, it can help them. So they're in a receptive mode, mm -hmm. okay? And when a person's in a receptive mode, that means oftentimes their entire being's willing to accept it. Their emotional body's ready for it. Sometimes you will get people come into your office and these are the most difficult clients. They're the ones that are only open intellectually to a reading. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that come in with the agenda. My mind is here today to know the answers to these 20 things. Those are your right. favorite clients. Raise your hand if you love those clients. Okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> those are the most difficult, exhausting clients. You know, like working with them is like working with a brick wall. It's hard to get anything out of the chart sometimes. It's just everything's stuck. But when you get the non no, people aren't like, totally that far off in, you know that far into the intellectual people are open and every part of them can be open to a reading now when you explain their chart right to them those symbols that you drop oh saturn is in this nakshatra or in this sign and this saturn as a result is doing this you're showing them a picture of their life mm -hmm. and they see that picture and seeing that picture can literally help them shift out of that picture into a healthier way of being Mm -hmm. And in that, a healing can take place. Mm -hmm. An astrologer can do that to himself, too, mm -hmm. if he doesn't get lost into the intellectualizing of it. Astrology is so big, it's so easy to get lost in the intellectualizing it, of it all. Right. So that's my words on that. Well, so, you know, this idea of healing and whatnot, and since we're talking about the nakshatras, you mentioned that you were using these um, a lot with uh, medical astrology. Yeah. Um, so is there anything that you could share or any ideas that have come to you about just how these might be applicable to people who have an interest in medical astrology and nakshatras? Okay. Really the most important thing I'm finding for medical astrology in the context of nakshatras are the, um, the Datu Mula Jiva, which is the mineral plant or animal qualities of the nakshatra. And then the nakshatra Pada as well. Okay. Okay. Because those, those two things, show how a person's, you know, on what level the person's stuck with that planet if it's a sick planet. It's okay. a healthy planet, they're flying on that level. So uh -huh. while you're saying sick planet, you mean like if you're actually reading the chart and you're seeing that there may be some negative avashtas towards it or bad dignity, yeah. that's what you mean? Yeah, some negative avashtas okay. will make a planet sick. <clears throat> the other thing that'll make a planet sick is that if it's, um, if it's um, low in... Uchabala, which means it's closer to debilitation than exaltation. So is it, which just simply, is it closer to deep exaltation or deep debilitation? If it's closer to deep debilitation, that's a strike against it. Uh -huh. Then you check his Chestabala. If a Chestabala is less than 30, it's on the weak side. More than 30, it's on the strong side. 
So you want to just look at Ishta and Kashta since those are the two things? I like to see them all separately, but you separately. can. You okay. can also just look at Ishta and make sure that Ishta is more than 30. Okay. But more important than both of those is the Digbala. Right. Is the planet have more than 30 Digbala or not? If a planet misses out on all three of those, it's usually the sickest planet in the chart, in my experience. Okay. okay? Sometimes people will have three or four planets that, in that way. And I find the, the people in my database who are, are non-functioning, they're not able to work. They're living off their family or Medicare because they're physically too ill to actually survive. Mm -hmm. They often have three or four planets low in all three of those things. So Uchabala, Cheshtabala, and Digbala. So this is, yeah. this is an aspect of like the, the, the yoga's formula, except we're living yeah. we're leaving out the Shuba Ashuba part. Yes, exactly. Leaving out okay. the Shuba Ashuba. Okay. That seems huge. So when the plant's like that, it's not able to make a healthy use of that energy of the nakshatra and it tends to succumb to disease. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then the Vadavashta is of course to come to disease because when planets starve, that's the common Vadavashta. If it's starved, yeah. when you're starved, you get sick, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the planets that are closer to Rahu and Ketu or in Rahu or Ketu's nakshatra, or even in the same, have the same Lord of the nakshatra as Rahu or Ketu, mm -hmm. those planets have more what I call poison on them. Mm -hmm. They're in an environment that's more conducive to being sick. So mm -hmm. the other things are strengths of the planet's, you know, ability to stay healthy or inability to stay healthy. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then if you put it in a sick environment, a poisonous environment, then it's going to get sick quicker. Okay. So those are the two things that I look at. And so with Rahu and Ketu again, it is with Rahu and Ketu and Rahu and Ketu's nakshatra. Is that what you said? Just um, or if it's in Rahu or Ketu's nakshatra, it's with or close to Rahu and Ketu. Okay. So like the closest planet to Rahu, the closest planet to Ketu. Okay. It's going to be more prone to being poisoned by Rahu or Ketu. Okay. And the further they get away from them, the more free they are of Rahu and Ketu. And then if, and that's of course, they're in Rahu's nakshatra or Ketu's nakshatra. Okay. So those, those are like the, you can say that's how toxic the environment is for the planet because Rahu and Ketu are poisonous, right? Right. So the closer the planet is, the more stressed it is um, by things it doesn't know how to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so if it's weak, it's going to succumb quicker, right? Whereas a strong planet there can weather all that stress of Rahu and Ketu and help burst through Rahu and Ketu. But the weak planets can't and they get sick and they're the ones that make a person sick. Okay. And then out of that sickness, they, I'll say they adopt the energy of that nakshatra. They'll adopt an animal plant or mineral energy. So they'll have a disease that has the energy of a mineral plant or animal. Okay. And then Can that you... disease is in a state, in a condition based on the nakshatra pada. Before we get into the pada idea, can you give an example of when you think of the Jiva Datu Mula, um, what would be an example of a type of disease tendency or for, for each of those? You know, if you yeah, like and that's the thing, you can have any disease tendencies arising out of any of those energies. Okay. But so you can't say, oh, it's in this, therefore, you know, you need that. What we, what we tell, we can tell that if they have an energy out of balance, that a similar energy as a plant, an animal or something. So for instance, um, one person, um, give an example. Okay. So one person who's sick, um, they had the energy of a snake. Okay. okay. Meaning of a sick snake in them. So again, look at this like native Americans, they would call it animal medicine. And they, like they found a turquoise, it was a medicine if, uh, and it had, everything was a medicine to them, which means everything has an energy to it. Mm -hmm. And that energy can be used to heal our imbalances that we have in our energy. As humans, we have the entire universe within us, all the nakshatras, everything that can be created. But that energy, and we have the energy to create anything out of us. But our energy is distorted, it's in balance in the context of our sick, unhealthy planet. Okay. And so the energy that's distorted in us is the energy that needs to be cured. And that might be a plant enemy, a mineral enemy, or um, uh, animal um, um, energy. Mm -hmm. And in the Shatabhikshak nakshatra, that's the hundred, it says the hundred cures of Indra are the all-encompassing sky above and all earth below. So it's basically saying everything on earth, 
everything on earth is a cure. While everything on earth falls into the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, or the mineral kingdom. Okay, even gases like oxygen falls in the mineral kingdom. Mineral kingdom is basically doctors means the essential components, the elements. We, it's, we should more call it, if minerals aren't the best kingdom to call it, we should call it the elemental kingdom, okay? okay. So, and that's what doctor literally means. It means the ex essential substance, okay? The basic substance. So, if a person has an energy out in the context of a mineral plant or um, animal, that energy is symbolically hurting their life mm -hmm. somehow. Um, and, and how that manifests as a disease, can, it, it can manifest in countless diseases. Mm -hmm. And the reason it can manifest in countless diseases, because the weak plants are going to show how that disease is manifesting. Okay. So if it's mercury, say, say it's mercury in a, you know, in a plant nakshatra in Pisces, it's going to be different than a mercury in a plant nakshatra in Virgo. Okay. Okay. So Mercury in Pisces is going to create a different disease than Mercury in Virgo. In fact, Mercury in Virgo is going to be very resistant to the disease, whereas Mercury in Pisces being closer to debilitation will succumb more easily. But again, we have to consider Digbala. So we can't, when it comes to saying predicting the disease, we actually need to focus on just our general medical astrology of planet signs and even houses, but mostly plants and signs. The nakshatra is the energy that's out of balance that manifests the disease. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that energy that's out of balance can manifest countless diseases. That's why, like in the science of homeopathy, you don't say, oh, I've got arthritis, and they say, oh, for arthritis, you need this remedy. Because mm -hmm. they realize that arthritis can grow out of hundreds of disturbed energy patterns. Medical astrology, or you know, modern medicine, what they do is they say, you've got arthritis. They say, oh, okay, I'm not interested in the energy that's out of balance to create that disease. I'm only interested in shutting the arthritis down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a chemical that shuts that pain down. So they can give the same chemical for every, just about every case of arthritis, and it'll shut the body down. They're basically saying, I'm going to shut down your body's ability to be inflamed. Well, so they give them cortisone, and it, it shuts down the ability of the body to inflame on anything, whether it's arthritis, a toothache, you know, a bruised elbow, anything, right? right? So a sprain. So... But that's not dealing, that's not helping to balance the energy. That's not taking the energy into account to heal. Healing only happens if we balance the energy. Healing that happens on any other level well, is, not, is not permanent. Mm -hmm. Because if the energy is still in balance, it'll find another way. That's why when people have arthritis, the energy is out of balance. They stop the arthritis with the anti-inflammatory. You know, now the energy can not express itself through the arthritis, but it's still sick energy. So now it's going to find another avenue to express itself. So in two years, it found a way and the person has a worse disease. Okay. You know, because the energy needs to express itself if it's sick. And, and people do that in their lives too. If someone has a rabid dog energy in them, literally they have the disturbed energy of a rabid dog and people actually have this. Or if they're not out there in Vietnam torturing people and cutting people and blowing people up, then what are they going to do? That energy is going to still kind of come out somewhere in a negative way. Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe they are abusing their wife, beating their kids and they don't want to, they, and they feel bad about it. They can't help it. That sick energy is there and that energy needs to be balanced. And so we so, can actually balance it based on, you know, these, the, these medicines of shot to be shot with all medicine, everything and everything on earth is a medicine. So with this idea, you know, it's using the idea of, um, Oh, arthritis or inflammation, well, uh, is there a way to determine, uh, maybe using these nakshatras or some of your other experience? Okay, so if someone has arthritis and they decide, okay, I'm going to change my diet. And by changing their diet, the inflammation goes away. Um, is, that, is that a kosher approach? Or would you say that there's even something below that? Or can it just be that you're you just happen to eat things that cause you inflammation? Okay. Um, diet strains the body. So it puts more stress on the energy of our body so our, our we have an energy imbalance and our body is trying to bring that back into balance you know it's trying to mm -hmm. now if we eat bad the body has less energy to do that process and so the disease advances why does it have less energy to do that to bring about balance in its energy because 
it has to instead deal, use its energy to process that bad food, mm -hmm. okay? To detox from the bad food, the liver, everything has to work harder, right? But if a, even if a person eats perfectly, it won't correct their energy imbalance. It won't cure it. It'll just reduce the strain on it. Okay. The reason it won't cure it because it's our mind that doesn't allow the energy balance to happen. See, in nature, in nature, everything take everything works in balance. Everything balances itself out. So if I have a fire, it's going to burn the forest down, right? But it's not mm -hmm. going to engulf the whole world because fire element gives rise to what we call the metal element, which is the little particles of, or the air element, metal elements are the same, which are little dust particles in the air that get blown around by the wind. And those little dust particles, moisture collects on them, which is the water element, and then it rains and the fires go out. So mm -hmm. nature has this self-correcting way. So even though nature can go to an extreme, it always self-corrects in time. Like Fashit said about humans, the natural thing about the natural nature of humans is to be unnatural. <laughs> okay. And so this is where we cause all of our problems. We don't follow the laws of nature. Why we don't have to, because we have this consciousness that's as powerful as the laws of nature. You know, our consciousness has the power. We have demigods, right? Even if we're ignorant, we're still using this huge arsenal of power, you know, mm -hmm. to affect our lives. And so, our delusions, our ideas, our concepts, our prejudices, all these things prevent our unnatural way of being, basically, prevent our energy system from auto-correcting. Mm. That's why we have to do some kind of therapy to help that energy auto-correct -cor itself. Mm -hmm. One therapy, of course, is meditations, pranayams. Those are all therapies to help bring the energy back into balance. Mm -hmm. Then there's homeopathy, you know, and there's these, you know, so there's different ways to try to bring the energy into balance. There's acupuncture when done properly, Chinese medicine when done properly, but only when, ener only when the cure is done on an energetic level will it stick. Mm -hmm. And even then a person can still get knocked off balance by severely traumatic events. Mm -hmm. Like the death of a loved one can just knock a person energetically off track. So long as there's any attachment, to the things of the world. As long as there's any attachment to oneself, the energy is always susceptible of being knocked off balance. Right. Okay. Well, I don't even know where to go after that. <laughs> okay. So we could back on my chakras for people. Eat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So let's go ahead and, and we'll, we'll move into the final portion of our, our, our time together. Um, so with, with what you've done with the Nakshatra Sutras, and I'll put a link to it um, at the bottom of this video, um, what is the take home that you would like people to, to get from your, you and Trishi's effort uh, in, this, uh, in this project? Um, really, I would just like people to contemplate more and understand that anything we get from anybody is, is coming at the tertiary level, a third level of experience. And that we always need, everyone needs to go back and use their own intelligence, cultivate their own understanding, you know, because ultimately it's our own understanding, developing our own understanding that's going to shift us, make us healthier people and make us better astrologers have a real understanding too. Mm -hmm. You know, just copying what other people say doesn't, isn't the right way to go. Mm -hmm. Everyone's experience is going to be different. Someone you know, there's an energy, that's the nakshatra. A person's going to experience that energy of that nakshatra in a certain way. But that's not the nakshatra, that's the, how they're experience of it. Right. And then they're going to tell you about their experience of it. Which is the third, so that's three steps away from the actual nakshatra, right? Mm -hmm. So if you just listen to what people tell you about nakshatras, you're, you're starting at step three. Mm. So their, their step three is your step one, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the right way to go on a trip, <laughs> right? So what I'm trying to do is say, okay, everyone, go to step one. Go to the sutras. I tried, I put a dictionary there so you can see the meanings of the Sanskrit words. Right. Go to the sutras and start at step one and develop your experience of the nakshatras. And then go share your experiences with nakshatras with other people. Everyone who's made, told, anyone who's written me about this, 
they've all come up with these insights that I thought were profound. I'm like, can I borrow that? You know, that's good in material. It's like people who I don't even consider intelligent astrologers mm -hmm. because they actually took the time to become an intelligent astrologer, right? Because right. people who aren't intelligent astrologers are astrologers who didn't take the time to contemplate something. That's the only difference, okay? <laughs> right. So these people who I've never heard a deep thought out of because they just were listening too much to other people. Mm -hmm. They spent some time in quiet with something and they came up with, this is why this is like us. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. And that was my goal of this text. And I talk about in the direction, take this, contemplate it, let's share it, you know? Let's share our experiences. Yes, let's be together. Let's connect. Let's share. Right. But understand that we're never going to share the sutra. You know, right. we're going to share our experiences of the sutra. But that's fun. That's a great reason to get together. Mm -hmm. And everyone has value here. Everyone, everyone's having value. People I never heard a good word of a sensible astrology word have made sense finally because they took the time. So I, I just want people to take the time. Don't look towards other people. Take the time to find out what you're capable of experiencing as truth. And that's okay. what sutras are for. That's why they exist. They only exist so one guy can make them up and tell everyone else what to do. If they were to be that way, the guys who wrote the sutras would have written them that way, right? Right. The sutras are for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I do remember trying to translate the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, and I would compare people's um, translations, and there'd be you know, three words in the sutra. Three words. And yeah. then I'd go, I'd go look at a, a translation and there'd be, you know, a paragraph. I know, I know. <laughs> and I'm like, how did they get that? <laughs> you no, know, it's like, give me the three words. And that's right. what they did on these sutras. Right. They took these four, basically four words in the sutra. Mm -hmm. I mean, each sutra has what, six words. Six words in the sutra, but two are the same in every sutra. It's basically four words in the sutra. Mm -hmm. And they took, or five, five things in the sutra. Four or five, I don't know, can't remember. Looks like there's six if you don't count Peristat and Avastat. Okay, we have the well, we have the, the qual we have the deity, the quality that's the nakshatra, the above and below. So we have four things. Right. Okay. So every nakshatra has four words basically. Yeah. But the translation everyone's been working on, and, and in this text, this text was reorganized um, by um, a guy. I don't um, don't recall his name. It's a really long name, so forgive me for not remembering it. And he wrote a commentary to this entire text. Okay. And so there's a commentary in each of these nakshatras where he writes quite a bit, where he has like three, four, five sentences for each of these nakshatras. But what we've been working with in the English language was someone who took that commentary, sort of, someone who took these sutras, sort of, and wrote something that we thought were sutras, but okay. they were never actual sutras. And so... Um, that's really restrictive and limiting. And I experienced it that way. And I think a lot of the other people struggled with it too. Mm -hmm. It was still the best thing we had. It was still useful, mm -hmm. but we need to go to those four words, not the six, eight, 10. So literally out of these four words, we're dealing with 30, 40, 30 words or something. Mm -hmm. None of them, which have anything to do with the bottom line of these four words. And so Everyone needs their individual experiences of these cosmic energies. Mm -hmm. And we can do that if we spend time cultivating that experience with the sutras. But right. we're only going to get the experience of another astrologer if we only contemplate what they have to say, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to keep it in the more basic form we can. And then we can expand on it. And yes, hearing what everyone else has to say will help our understanding of it. But I think we need to start with the first step. Let's all start on step one and know we're on step one. And then run up the stairs together. Right. So have our have uh, have your have our own understanding first, and then once we have our own understanding, then we can talk about it with others. Yeah, and then we can build on it, and then we'll go back to the sutra and get more. Always go back to the sutras. Right. Go back to step one to get more. You don't go to step two to get more. You, you get finish, and then you start over and go deeper. Right. 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 Okay. It's like well, digging excellent. a hole. If yes. you dig a hole, you stick the shovel in the ground, you dig out a piece of dirt. You carry it over to your dirt pile, you dump it there. Mm -hmm. And you go back to the same hole and dig in, dig in the same place, right? You don't dig another hole somewhere else, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? So always go back to the sutra, to that first hole, and keep digging until you get to the center of the world. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Well, uh, final thought is, you know, we, we did mention um, uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg. 
And um, some people say, <laughs> some people say that chickens are just eggs way of reproducing. Chickens are just eggs way of reproducing. <laughs> <laughs> That makes sense because, you know, a chicken lays a lot more eggs than eggs like chicken. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, thank you, Ernst, for being here with me today. And I think we covered some good ground with this. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what people come up with as they study this work that you and Trish right. together. All right. Good talking to you. Take care. You too. Take care.